Talat from MenaFam. And last but not least, Farah Al Shami from Arab Reform Initiative. Please, Salam. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, going to uh, to speak in Arabic. مساء الخير للجميع يسرني باسمي وباسم مؤسسة فريدريش إبات أن أرحب بجميع المشاركات والمشاركين في هذه الجلسة عن تأثير سياسات المؤسسات المالية الدولية ونقصد هنا كل من الصندوق والبنك الدوليين على الحماية الاجتماعية في المنطقة العربية تعمل مؤسسة فريدريش إبات وهي مؤسسة سياسية ألمانية تؤمن بالفكر الديمقراطي والعدالة الاجتماعية كشرط أساسي للتقدم الاقتصادي والتنمية الاجتماعية منذ سنوات ومن خلال مشروعها الإقليمي سياسات اقتصادية من أجل العدالة الاجتماعية على فهم العلاقة بين السياسات الاقتصادية وتأثيراتها على العدالة الاجتماعية والحقوق الأساسية للإنسان في المنطقة العربية تشير المعطيات الاقتصادية الاجتماعية في المنطقة العربية خلال العقدين السابقين من الزمن إلى تراجع ملحوظ ومثير للقلق للمؤشر للمؤشرات التنموية الاجتماعية والاقتصادية على الرغم من أن مؤشرات صندوق النقد الدولي الوردية حول تحسن معدلات النمو الاقتصادي والاستقرار المالي ليس فقط ارتفاع معدلات الفقر وزيادة نسبة التفاوت في الدخول ارتفاع نسبة عدم المساواة بين الجنسين التفاوت المناطقي والتفاوت بين الريف والمدينة ما يثير القلق بل أيضا ارتفاع نسبة البطالة والعمالة الغير الرسمية والتي تترك آلاف لا بل ملايين الأسر والأطفال بدون أي حد أدنى من الحماية الاجتماعية والحياة الكريمة هذه الفئة من الأشخاص غالبا ما يكون معرضون أكثر من الآخرين لأي لأي كوارث وهذا بشكل ملحوظ رأيناه في في الكوارث التي حصلت مؤخرا في المنطقة في المغرب في نتيجة الزلزال وأيضا في درنا نتيجة الفيضان في في ليبيا وهنا يعني نريد أن نعرب عن تضامننا مع هذه الفئة تحديدا التي تعاني أكثر من غيرها جراء هذه هذه السياسات التي أثرت على وضع الاجتماعي. كل هذا التدهور في المستوى الحياة والحقوق يترافق للأسف بعجز مستمر ومتراكم للدولة على النهوض بمسؤولياتها الاجتماعية وتراجع خطير ومستمر لمساهمات القطاعات الإنتاجية أقصد الصناعة والزراعة بالناتج المحلي الإجمالي والتي عادة ما تكون المحرك الأساسي لنمو الاقتصاد والتشغيل وسوق العمل إن كل هذه التطورات السلبية تتطلب إعادة نظر بالسياسات السائدة وأيضا المطبقة منذ عقود في هذه المنطقة وذلك بطلب ومباركة الصندوق والبنك الدولي يعني. إن الحاجة لتغيير هذا المنظور تنبع من تأثيراتها الاجتماعية المشحفة ولكن أيضا من حقيقة أن هذه السياسات لم توفي بأهدافها المرجو منها مثل النمو، خبط العجز الحكومي، معالجة البطالة والفقر لا على العكس كما نرى اليوم تعاني هذه الدول من عجز حكومي أكبر وعدم قدرة على سداد الديون كما تعاني شعوب هذه الدول وهذا الأهم من مزيد من البطالة والفقر واللامثواة والظلم الاجتماعي والاقتصادي الكبيرين في هذا السياق يسعدني أن نستمع اليوم إلى مداخلات من خبيرات وخبراء ناشطات وناشطين من المنطقة وأتطلع جدا للنقاش معكن ومعكم وأخيرا أتوجه بالشكر لكل المنظمات والمنظمين لهذه الجلسة من زميلاتي في مشروع سياسات اقتصادية ومبادرة الإصلاح العربي ومن أيضا نتويك مينا فيم كما أشكر مسبقا المتحدثات والمتحدثين على هذا البنل وشكرا جزيلا للحضور الكريم لوجوده معنا شكرا شكرا سلام مساء الخير أنا هتكلم بالعربي دلوقتي لكن في الجلسة هتكلم بالإنجليزي للأسف أنا بتأسف من الأول أنا اسمي شيرين طلعت أنا مديرة منافم موفمنت فور إيكونوميك ديفلوبمنت أند إيكولوجيكال جاستس حركة نسوية للعدالة الاقتصادية والإيكولوجية والتنمية من الشرق الأوسط وشمال أفريقيا في الحقيقة أمر مهم قوي إن إحنا موجودين بنتكلم النهاردة على السياسات الخاصة بالحماية الاجتماعية وال... وال... في... على هامش مش على هامش ولكن 
بالتوازي مع وجود الـ الـ annual meetings للبنك والصندوق لانه في الحقيقه في رايي انه بالضر... احنا لازم نربط ال ال حوارنا او او الادفوكسي اللي بنميها حوالين الحمايه الاجتماعيه بالضروره نربطها بمسؤوليتهم وب الديون والتقشف كابطال او مش مش ابطال بقى ال 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 في الدراما بيبقى في الشخصيه دايما من الايفل شخصيه لان هم الايفل شخصيه او الايفل ميجرز اللي بتهدد كل سياسات الحمايه الاجتماعيه وللاسف مؤسستي البريتن وودز اللي احنا موجودين اللي موجوده النهارده على ارض مراكش هم من ابطال هذا المسلسل الاليم للاسف انا انا سعيده ان انا موجوده ايضا وسط زميلات وايضا نسويات وطبعا زملاء ولكن مهم انه اللي احنا في رايي يعني وفي راي مؤسستي انه حتى يتم التغيير في هذا العالم لازم نبتدي نتكلم على التغيير الشامل ليس فقط البدائل والتغيير الشامل في رايي اللي قد يكون ناجع في ظل هذه الازمات المتعدده على راي البنك والصندوق بولي كرايسيس ولكني شايفه انها يعني اعمق بكثير من البولي تغيير شامل للنظام الاقتصادي العالمي ليصبح نسوي عادل واخضر وبتهيالي يعني علشان نقدر نبدا نتكلم على ده اللي بالضروره نتكلم على سياسات الحمايه الاجتماعيه احب برضو انوه انه تم اطلاق حمله عالميه حول سياسات الحمايه الاجتماعيه منذ اقل من اسبوع شركاء هذه الحمله موجودين معنا النهارده اتمنى وقت الدسكشن كمان يدونا بعض تشد يعني يلقوا الضوء على ايضا هذه الحمله وكيفيه مشاركتكم فيها مهم يبقى في تمثيليه للمنطقه في النوع ده من الحملات العالميه انا مش هطول عليكم لاني للاسف هتكلم في البانل الجايه معلش ولكن هدي الفلور لزميلتي فرح الشيم تفضل Thank you. Thanks, uh, Shirin and Hamad, for uh, moderating. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm going to be speaking in English in case you need to switch interpretation. And for those who came in late, uh, we do have interpretation available in all three languages, Arabic, French, and English. So I'm Farah Al-Shami. I'm a senior fellow at the Arab Reform Initiative and um, ARI's um, Social Protection Program Director. On behalf of ARI and on behalf of its executive director, Mr. Nadim Houri, who's in the plane now coming here, and hopefully Hopefully he'll be able to make it to the cocktail reception and meet you all. I would like to welcome you. And I didn't prepare any like kind of official introductory remarks, but I want to emphasize why are we here? Why is this gathering important? It is basically uh, on the occasion, of course, of the annual meetings, the IMF and World Bank annual meetings. We often speak about um, their role in debt austerity surcharges. We speak about climate finance. We speak about so many topics and we forget the pivotal role that they are playing when it comes to social protection and to promoting or to actually hindering the right to uh, social uh, security for all, for everyone. And this is what we have been all working uh, towards. We forget that they are basically um, uh, limiting social protection systems in the Arab region to very tiny, small social safety nets that are poverty targeted, uh, that they are uh, because of their austerity measures and because of the debt trap that they're making us fall into, they are shrinking the fiscal space that is available for us to spend on social services, public services, on our social welfare systems in general. We forget often that they privatize social pensions, that they reduce uh, employers' contributions to uh, universal social security systems. So it is a very, they are playing indeed a pivotal role uh, Th uh, there or on this level and we need to coordinate messages so we are all working on this level we are all trying to voice out uh, at the annuals but it is very important that all of these efforts uh, do not remain scattered do not remain um, that we 
turn this duplication of efforts, I always say this sentence, into concerted efforts, into joint efforts, because we need to be united and we do need to coordinate messages so that we can make a stronger impact because we are dealing with a lack of political will basically to change and to uh, achieve the desired goals that we are uh, trying to uh, to work towards. We are basically this ecosystem or community of practice and knowledge uh, working on the topic in the Arab region. And we need to also work all, all together to mobilize a larger ecosystem, a larger ecosystem of CSOs, of activists, even academics, um, civil society in its broad meaning. We do need to mobilize it and to equip it with the knowledge, with the recommendations and with all the advocacy tools that it needs to basically uh, raise the voice and try uh, to make Huayda Ruman has uh, uh, written for us and that she will be presenting later when the panel starts. Um, this, uh, for, for, for more about Ari's work, please uh, feel free to scan these barcodes. Uh, these fly just around the, just around the corner. Yes, uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you all for uh, these uh, opening remarks. Uh, now I invite uh, the participants uh, and uh, the speakers, panelists of um, the impact of IFIs on social protection in the Arab region. Uh, so please join us, uh, Imen, Isabel. And online also, Huayda. So what, um, actually I was planning to give you the full bios of uh, all the panelists from the beginning, but then I said, okay, maybe it's better that each time a panelist is uh, about to speak that you know more about him. And um, I think it's uh, it would be more convenient for you. Uh, but before that, um, let me introduce myself. I mean, we're, we're gonna spend the evening together. Uh, I'm a consultant and a, a journalist, former journalist, non-resident fellow at the Arab Reform Initiative. And I authored a report uh, called Mapping uh, the External Debt of Tunisia, which is a political economy report on the complexities of uh, Tunisia's uh, public debt management. And I've also worked on free trade and the judicial institutions. And in uh, another life, I was uh, reporting for Reuters. I guess you did too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for Le Monde uh, or Agence France Presse. And, and this week with uh, Frédéric Abert Stiftung, we're launching a podcast on uh, popularizing some economic concepts. And I had the pleasure to produce these podcasts. Uh, welcome to all of you. We're starting with Huayda Adlirman. She's a consultant for Arab Reform Initiative, and she's a professor of political science, uh, also affiliated with the National Center for Social and Criminolog Criminological Research in Egypt. She will be presenting her uh, latest book for ARI, uh, The Guide Towards Universal Social Protection in the Arab Region, Challenges and Opportunities. Uh, Huayda, it is our pleasure to have you with us, even Thank if you're remote, but you're here with us uh, fully. Thank you very much. So please, the floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you very much. Um, طبعا انا مبسوطه ان انا يعني كنت اتمنى ان ابقى موجوده فيزيكلي بس للاسف يعني حصل شويه حاجات كده لكن انا طبعا مبسوطه ان انا معاكم اونلاين يعني الحقيقه كانت فرصه بالنسبه لي هايله ان انا اشتغل مع الارب ريفورم انيشيتيف عن موضوع الحمايه الاجتماعيه في دراسه تفصيليه على اربع بلدان من المنطقه العربيه واللي انا هعرض نتائج الدراسه اللي هي فعلا صدرت في كتاب عن عرب ريفورم انيشيتيف في الايام الماضيه. I will share the screen now. يمكن انا هلتقط الخيط من الـ الـ الكلام اللي حصل من الزملاء على المنصه حالا ان احنا للاسف ممكن يبقى عندنا خطاب 
دولي في التنمية وردي وبيتكلم عن الأهداف الإنمائية وأجندة عشرين ثلاثين وغيرها من الأمور لكن الحقيقة الممارسات التنموية سواء من النظام الاقتصادي النيو ليبرالي أو من الممارسات التنموية من المؤسسات الدولية بتبقى عكس كده خالص وده اللي بيخلينا نقول ان الحقيقه المساله مش مساله ان 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 مؤسسات دوليه بتشجع على التنميه وان البنك الدولي في كتير من دراساته بيشتغل على خطاب تنموي يعني عادل ومنصف لكن الحقيقه الممارسات على الارض بتكون غير كده في السياسات بتاعه هذه المؤسسات الماليه الدوليه. موضوع الحمايه الاجتماعيه في المنطقه العربيه موضوع شائك وموضوع فيه كتير من الاشكاليات القضيه الاساسيه بحل النقاش في الكتاب الحقيقه كانت على مدى امكانيه توسيع نطاق الحمايه الاجتماعيه عشان تشمل اكثر الفئات هشاشه واستبعاد في اربع بلدان محل دراسه في الاردن وتونس ولبنان ومصر الكتاب بيبدا ان هو بيحل الواقع الحمايه الاجتماعيه بشكل عام في البلدان محل الدراسه وبيركز على اربع فئات اساسيه وكل فئه من دول كان في مبررات للتركيز عليها الحقيقه قويه جدا الفئه الاولى الاطفال والفئة الثانية المسنين والعمالة غير الرسمية والشباب خارج التعليم والتدريب والعمل اللي هو بيطلق عليهم بالإنجليزي نيت الحقيقة إن كل مجموعة من دول الأطفال هنبص نلاقي على لو بصينا على وضعهم فيما يتعلق بالحماية الاجتماعية في المنطقة العربية هنلاقي إن هم نسبة التغطية بالحماية الاجتماعية 15% تقريبا وطبعا البيانات دي كلها في الكتاب من الأطفال هم اللي متغطين بالحماية الاجتماعية في المنطقة العربية في حين إن النسب دي على المستوى العالمي بتصل ل 26.4 وفي مناطق أخرى بتصل تتجاوز ال 50% وال 70 وال 80% وبالتالي هنا لو احنا بنتكلم على اطفال بيعانوا من عدم التغطيه بالحمايه الاجتماعيه وعدم الشمول بالحمايه الاجتماعيه وفي طبعا هم في الاغلب فقراء فاحنا هنا بنتكلم على الحقيقه على الحقيقه على اننا هنظل يعني ندور في حلقه توارث الفقر عبر الاجيال ودي على فكره حلقه احنا مش عارفين نكسرها في المنطقه خالص فكره توارث الفقر هنفضل نتكلم على اننا القدره الانتاجيه للمجتمع هتظل على مدى اجيال وطبعا اجراءات التقشف الحاليه دلوقتي اللي بتتخذ في كثير من البلدان العربيه بتاثر بالاصل على الاطفال يعني اجراءات التقشف لو سمحت استاذه هويدا ابطا شويه المعذره للمقاطعه كان يو تيرن اوف يور كاميرا سو بتسمعني؟ اوكي بيرفكت الله يخليك اوكي ف هنكتشف ان هذه الفئه الفئه دي بتتمتع بقدر من الحمايه الاجتماعيه لكن الحقيقه ممكن يكون في مجال التعليم لكن الاطفال الاقل من خمس سنوات بيعانوا من مشاكل كثيره في مجال الصحه والتغذيه ومؤشراتهم الحقيقه فيما يتعلق بالتقزم وسوء التغذيه بتؤشر على ذلك. الفئه الثانيه الحقيقه هي فئه المسنين وفئه المسنين الحقيقه احنا اعداد المسنين عندنا في المنطقه العربيه يقترب من 21 مليون مسن في في 2020 مع 20 50 هيوصلوا ل 71 مليون مسن. الحقيقه في تراجع في نسب التغطيه بالتامينات الاجتماعيه نتيجه تراجع التوظيف الحكومي واتساع القطاع غير الرسمي بشكل كبير اللي هو دلوقتي وهو الفئه الثالثه اللي هندرسها اللي هو دلوقتي تقريبا 70% من قوه العمل شامله العماله غير الزراعيه شامله العماله الزراعيه قطاع غير رسمي او عماله غير رسميه. الفئه الثالثه اللي هي الشباب خارج التعليم والتدريب والعمل وهي فئه من الشباب المهمش الهش اللي هو الحقيقه لا بيتعلم ولا بيتدرب ولا بيشتغل وبالتالي هي فئه في سن الشباب بتعاني من قدر كبير من الحرمان وهذه الفئه الحقيقه يعني بتزداد في المنطقه العربيه يصل عددها او تصل نسبتها في المنطقه العربيه حوالي 34% بوينت 4 من الشباب والحقيقه دي نسبه عاليه مقارنه بمعدل عالمي حوالي 22% الحقيقه الفئات دي كلها كانت محل اهتمام في الكتاب بنحاول ان احنا نعرض اوضاعها عبر مجموعه من المؤشرات الكميه اللي بتبين قد ايه هم محرومين من حقوقهم الاساسيه في الحمايه الاجتماعيه وكمان بنطرح بعض الحلول لشمولهم بالحمايه الاجتماعيه طبعا هو المقصود بالشمول هي مجموعه سياسات متكامله مصممه لضمان دخل امن ولدعم كل البشر خلال دوره حياتهم الكامله والحقيقه ده بيخليني اتكلم في نقطه مهمه ان فكره ان احنا في المنطقه العربيه الحكومات دايما بتنظر للحمايه نعم المعذره المقاطعه مره اخرى 
You are screen sharing? Uh, yes. المعذرة المقاطعة مرة أخرى فقط للتأكد الـ الـ presentation بتاعك العنوان الحالي هو مفهوم مفهوم الشمول هو المفهوم المركزي عن صح بالضبط. يعني بالضبط. بالضبط. مفهوم الشمول هو المفهوم المركزي في الدراسة وهو السؤال الأساسي أو المشكلة البحثية تسمعني؟ حضرتك سامعني كده؟ المشكلة البحثية اللي هي بتحاول تجاوب عليها الدراسة That was the question, yeah. Some, particip yeah, some people, some participants in the room were asking if في مشكلة؟ حضرتك سامعني؟ هل 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 صوتي مسموع؟ آه انترنت بطيء هل استكمل الحوار؟ ويلكم باك هويدا مرحبا بك من جديد اوكي المفهوم المركزي هو مفهوم الشمول ومفهوم الشمول هو لله الشمول هو مجموعة سياسات متكاملة مصممة لضمان ضمان دخل آمن ودعم كل البشر خلال دورة حياتهم ودي الحتة اللي أنا وقفت عليها لأن كتير من الحكومات الحقيقة بتبص للحماية الاجتماعية على إنها توسع شبكات الأمان الاجتماعي اللي هي السيفتي نتس وبالتالي هنا تدي مساعدات اجتماعية للفقراء الحقيقة الحماية الاجتماعية مش بتقتصر على كده بس شبكات الحماية الاجتماعية هي جزء من الحماية الاجتماعية وليست كل الحماية الاجتماعية عشان كده مفهوم الشمول الحقيقه بيضم كل سياسات الحمايه الاجتماعيه في حزمه واحده والحقيقه بيحاول ان هو يضمن الحراك من من بين كل المنظومات دي استاذه هويدا اعتذر على المقاطعه ولكن اعتقد ان الانترنت قد فصل من جانب المؤتمر لا يسمعوننا الان لذا انا اتواصل مع الفريق حاليا في ذلك المكان وبامكانك استكمال الافكار فقط عندما يعودوا ايوه فرع شكرا لصدرك
austerity policies. I, for us, have often advocated for for austerity measures in many countries. I mean, like if you, um, two days ago we had counter space that claim our future space, and my colleague, um, Suzanne Nada, was speaking about the same formula. If you just take the the name of the country out, you will find the same uh, formula. If you if you take Jordan out, Morocco out, Egypt, you also find the same the same formula. Uh, so uh, those 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 policies leading to reduce public spending and on social welfare programs, uh, this can result a uh, um, a huge dimension social safety net impacting vulnerable population including the poor and marginalized communities um, reduction in subsidizes structure ad adjustment program recommended by the ifi sometimes involve uh, taban of course not sometimes but always involves cutting in uh, uh, subsidize and essential goods have a high impact specifically on 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 gender on women um again we were we were having this meeting yesterday with the uh, first deputy of uh, the head of the IMF. And one of the points that we were speaking about is cutting on, um, cutting subsidies on the energy sector and how they affect uh, specifically women. Um, maybe upon a discussion that I had with Iman before, we don't have the same infrastructure like the, the European countries, for example. So we don't have a, a, a transportation system that can allow women to access, for example, their workspaces. And the problem is those kind of policies and measures, and speaking of the IMF, doesn't have uh, any, any kind of local lens when they are uh, 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 targeting social programs. I remember, for example, in in 2016, I guess, when the IMF had uh, a program, one of the programs in Egypt, and they were, uh, one of the recommendations was uh, opening uh, uh, spaces for, uh, w yeah, for women in the, in the workforce. The kindergarten, yeah. And the problem is that they don't they don't they don't have any clue about the, the Egyptian law. The Egyptian law uh, says in this that if you have 100 women in the work facility, you are obliged to have a, a kindergarten. And because we don't have a paternal we don't have a paternal leave, you only have a maternal leave, because also the patriarchal system that we are living under uh, thinks that uh, taking care of the children is only our uh, uh, own responsibility, uh, which is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's another story that we are going to speak about. Yeah, it's a, exactly. And so, I mean, because of this program, many women lost their job. I mean, Taban, when they are speaking about this specific program, they are uh, putting it, when they were discussing their gender study, they were putting this program as one of the examples of the gen their gender policy. So this is how uh, IFI uh, 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 impacts social protection in the region. Um, also, limited access to resources. Uh, I've, I've, I've eyes back the economic uh, uh, reforms that uh, affects women as we as we uh, uh, mentioned before. Also, legal and social barriers that sometimes the the I've eyes doesn't put in consideration, as we mentioned before. <clears throat> when it comes to environmental lens uh, and uh, uh, and resource intensive projects, MENA. Many countries often rely on funding from IFIs, and that comes with um, a bill. That comes with a bill. And to be honest, everything with IFIs for us comes with a bill. The, of course, the huge bill is paid from our social protection system that is always 
uh, uh, under jeopardizing and under being uh, a lot of threats of any kind of a little bit more on our uh, on our sovereign debt or on our external debt on any kind of those kind of unfair policies for example uh, the imf and excuse me that I, I i know i want to shed more lights on different ifis but because we were speaking uh, with the imf all day long so the imf for example had this sewer charge policy so the charges policy is an added an added uh, uh, money. I'm just wanted to, to make it more simple, an added uh, uh, amount of money and added uh, on the loan interest for countries like, like Egypt, like Tunisia, like Jordan, that uh, lo have a uh, loan on, on, um, on more, uh, they need more time to bear the loan. And actually, they also uh, take, uh, yani going to the cycle of debt, debtening from the uh, IMF, uh, in, in in a more regular way. Like, for example, uh, Egypt just had um, a program last year and now they are negotiating a new program. So for them, they are adding more charges on the uh, uh, loan interest for us. That is surcharge. Sometimes in some countries, it can go up to 100% of the loan itself. So, and I want to tell you that, for example, in, in Jordan, they are paying around 60% of the loan that can help in reforming their, their educational system. In, in, uh, in Tunisia also, uh, the, the 35 to 40% of solar charges can help Tunisia in uh, 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 working on, on their health or reforming their health system. So, uh, uh, that's why uh, solar charges are one of uh, uh, the major topics that when we speak about social spendings and austerity, we need to speak uh, about. I mean, for me, debt, uh, uh, debt and what comes with debt with, from un with unfair policies is uh, uh, related to any other uh, uh, kind of policies like this. Uh, spending on, on climate is affected by debt. Spending on on uh, on social prote protection always affected by that. Um, so um, I know that I'm I'm only here to speak about the 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 impacts of social protection and of the eyes on 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 social protection. But I want to to drag your attention of uh, uh, those specifically who are who are working on uh, uh, on uh, austerity and debt that. that they need from now on to accompany uh, their discourse with climate and social protection because we cannot. Uh, we, I mean, the world is 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 going through a very dark spot. I, I'm 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 really a happy person. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not trying to 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 drive you to to this uh, to this spot, but we have to. Uh, understand that we need to stay to stand in solidarity uh, 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 to face this crisis. And those IFIs has a huge responsibility towards people and climate. And maybe sometimes they do not understand the language that we're speaking. And here I'm not saying that we need to adopt this this yani their language, but. We need to know and to and to 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 really follow their discourse to be able to uh, produce our own uh, uh, um, uh, transformational uh, uh, policies and and system. We cannot just uh, give our back to those IFIs because they are a status quo in our daily life. And maybe I will add more around this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, at 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Shirin, again. Um, now it's uh, Iman Sharif's turn. And just for people uh, over there, the presentation will be the final one. So, if you can uh, just leave it for, for later. Iman, 
uh, regional program manager. Uh, you work on economic policies for social justice in the MENA region in the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And among the projects you managed, let me mention the social protection and the IMF in Morocco, Tunisia, and Jordan. Um, and so one of the ideas behind this project is that in a situation where austerity and increasing debt are um, continue to burden state budgets, the question was how can uh, we work towards a more universal, inclusive, and adequate social protection? And you published an insightful report and uh, and covered the role of IMF in shrinking the social protection. So you might find some books from FES and this one uh, just right there on the right when you enter. Um, and um, this book is uh, actually uh, case studies from Tunisia, Jordan, and Morocco, uh, written by academics and CSO activists. Your um, presentation today, your uh, intervention, will be about IFI subsidies and debt and social activism in reaction to consequent rights violation. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, I also want to mention that also we are working in Egypt and we have um, a chapter on Egypt also available online that we didn't print and we have the author here so please speak with him Semadieb, and he will be presenting um, the Egypt chapter during our one of our session during the civil society policy forum uh, next Thursday so publicity please go this adv <laughs> please please attend uh, on Thursday at nine <laughs> on Friday ah, at, on Friday no it's it's on Thursday at nine I have my calendar here <laughs> okay okay we, we 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 will we will check this later so um so when we were preparing this um this event i was i was pre i was planning to present the results of our three chapters uh on uh, tunisia especially with tunisia and also morocco and jordan and the impact of ifis especially after uh, 2011, the uprisings of 2011. Um, but also, I wanted to use this opportunity to think together of um, how can we really shift the narrative. And I will, I will share with you my personal thinking, like how it it um, in, it was evolving during the last last weeks. Uh, um, so last month I was attending with the Farah Shemi, with Salma, with uh, many of our colleagues here, and I see Shafiq who were organizing this uh, conference on social protection in the MENA region. And it seemed that we all agreed on um, how the cash transfers was not not resolving our problems in the region, how it, it's increasing inequalities, um, and how we ne really need new solutions. And I'm happy here we have we have Isabel who we're presenting all the time concrete alternatives and really realistic. And I was like, why are we still meeting again and discussing these things that we we agree? And then we had we had also this uh, reclaiming our future conference with colleagues, and we said. Uh, we we seemed all that we are on the uh, on the same page and we're very happy with our results and <laughs> and we will we will boycott the CSPF again. But yesterday I attended the civil society town hall with uh, with Kristalina Georgieva and who is the managing director of the IMF uh, and one of our colleagues from Tunisia and Salma is here <laughs> was also was also with her, with us. And um, he was asking about the the loan in Tunisia, and we, we can't reach an agreement within the, the Tunisian president and the IMF because of the conditionalities, and mostly because of uh, IMF asking Tunisia to remove all the subsidies on uh, food and um, and energy that we already uh, like. We Tunisia, we already um, were like trying to apply all the all the IMF agreements and the conditional conditionalities, and now we like the social situation and the um, um, the movement in the country is, is is like is very difficult and the situation of uh, of poor families and also the middle class uh, is. Is not, it's just not possible. So the president of the uh, the president and uh, we will not 
talk about politics in Tunisia now, uh, is, is refusing the conditionalities that the IMF is imposing. And now we have a blockage and this will will um, will leave us with more problems again with the, uh, with the economic situation in Tunisia. And one of our colleagues were, were asking uh, yesterday, the managing director of the, um, of the IMF, uh, if we can still have an agreement if the IMF will be more flexible and accept to to remove one of or two of the conditionalities. And her answer was really provocative. Uh, provocative. She was like, we are not funding subsidies for rich people. And it, it, it seems very evident for us because we are already have evidence and we are showing that these subsidies were, were mostly 60% for, um, uh, for middle class and the middle class in Tunisia is not the middle class in Europe, and it's only serving nine percent for for the rich families who are not rich. If we compare them in to to uh, rich families in Europe, because the minimum wage in Tunisia is around one hundred fifty euros, and it's so. Um, after working on this program after four years, I was like, this is enough we st still should stop speaking about social protection but yesterday i i understood that we still continue to work on that we still we still need more events more space to uh, to speak about uh, about um, uh, to, to try to shift the narrative and change um like at least to find a calm, common ground where we can speak with the IMF representatives. And that's why we keep coming to C C CSPF. And uh, I know that many of our, uh, our partners here are very frustrated to, con uh, to, um, um, to, to speak with them. So, um, OK, we'll, let's, let's come back to, to, um, to the situation in Tunisia and the programs we had. So after the uprisings of 2011, <coughs> Uh, Tunisia had a first program in 2013 with the IMF, and I think that this this program was also because Tunisia had needs in like in cash in foreign por foreign currency uh, to pay for um, for the salaries of um, of people working in the healthcare sector in the education sector and also to make the country move. And it, this is, it was like a result of the uprising in 2011 of people asking for more social justice, asking for opportunities to work, and asking for a better health healthcare system. Um, but the result that now the situation is deteriorate, deteriorating and that the, the public spending in education and, um, and health is, is decreasing, and this is also with the with the, with the, with the figures that we are collecting from from the World Bank database, and also from the the Tunisian the Tunisian authorities' results. In uh, in 2018, the protest was very clear that they started at the moment where the the the, the parliament was um, um, how do you say the. Um, discussing the, the the budget of the of the Tunisian government with more austerity measures and more um, uh, action on the um, in increasing subsidies and uh, subsidies on 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 basic foods and also on on energies. Uh, again, in uh, in 2020, with the COVID-19 pandemic and all its impacts on. Uh, um, on uh, people's life and uh, people who, who lost their jobs, and especially on the um, uh, informal sector, which is representing almost 20, uh, 50 percent of the of of the economy in Tunisia. Um, so then we had we had we faced really really um, uh, an important moment where the government was trying to give cash transfers. To households who lost their jobs, at to, to, to poor households, and then we understood that we don't have any database, any database even on paper of the poor households. It was really managed by, like we say, like, with love in the country. <laughs> and and this is not realistic that now 
all the reform of the Amen social uh, program of social protection is to remove more subsidies and to give more cash transfers when we don't have any infrastructure to, <clears throat> to track them and to know who are people in need. Um, uh, and this is, and I think that I, I don't I don't know how we we should we should act again. I think I I'm all the time thinking about this situation, personal level, <laughs> and um, I think that I'm impatient impatient to 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 have action, and um, I I think that. Um, with all these meetings and coalitions that we are we, we are trying, I think that also at look level, like people they need to take action, and uh, it's really deteriorating. Um, yeah, and this can be possible only with democracy, and that's why. Um, um, When we are advocating for more social justice, to continue advocating for demo democracy uh, and for citizen citizen participation in the in the um, uh, in the political political sphere, this is this is it, uh, Mohammed. I can. Thank you so much, Ben. Isabel Isabel Ortiz, uh, you're the director of the Global Social Justice Program at uh, the Initiative for Policy Dialogue in uh, Columbia University. And you were director at the ILO and UNICEF. Um, you have um, your PhD from LSE, and you have more than 90 publications. And after these overviews um, of the situation, be it from the gender or geographic perspective or uh, and the impact of uh, the IFIs on social protection, you will be proposing uh, alternatives and presenting solutions uh, that uh, we will have on the screen with your presentation and that uh, I guess we will be discussing right after that. So please, the floor is yours and the presentation is there. Wonderful. I was doubting if it was going to work and let me check. Oh, this is not working, you see? It's not on, okay, uh, on, okay. Let me fix it for you. Yeah. Try, try, in case I'm not doing right. It works? So, this is the opposite direction. Ah, you see, because we're in the Arab world, yes. Okay, so I'm going to stand up because otherwise I cannot see what I'm presenting. But I would like to start by First, thanking the organizers of this big event, which is, you know, really great to be here. And some of you may have heard um, some of these messages, so I will go quick. And I would like to start by really, really supporting the, me the, the key messages that Shirin and Imene gave. And I would like to give them with numbers, though. And so, okay, let's see if it works. Yeah. This is how the IMF sees the world. And this is based on IMF fiscal projections. And in red are the countries that are um, cutting public spending or having austerity cuts. And as you can see, the whole world is on fire. It does not mean that this is going to happen. It means this is how IMF economies see their world in their projections. Hmm? But still, there's options to change that. Um, so that's why we're going to talk about the alternatives. In terms of the policies that they follow, yeah, I don't know. No. Aha, uh -huh. so that's the, what I have to do. So it sees me. Sorry. Very good. And now, it's because I might not. Uh, okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so this is the formula. This is the formula that Shirin was talking about. And this is done, and 
in a large number of countries. And what we did is reading about 700 IMF country reports to understand what was the recommendations of the IMF. And this is what you get. And the first measure is targeting social protection. Um, this is in the majority of countries. And as they were talking, this is insufficient. Oop. Oop. Bueno, I really do need. Aha, uh -huh, OK. The second will be the second most common measure is cuts or caps to the wage bill. And that's the number of the salaries of civil servants, which uh, like teachers, health workers, uh, civil servants at the local level, all, all of them are very important for social issues. And if you do that, you erode public services. So it's very important. The third one, eliminating subsidies. And the fourth one is privatization of public services. But now they use another term. They use reform of state-owned enterprises. And for that, they refer to actually public transport, water supply, and really public services that are normal to be public. And um, then we go to pension reforms, very important for the campaign of the right of social security, and uh, labor flexibilization, and other social security reforms, including waiving the um, employer's contributions to social security, which is awful, because these are part of workers' compensation and should really be given back to, to workers and be put in social security because it's part of the future pensions. Hmm? And others like consumption taxes and all that. And I'm going to skip the next ones, but um, I just wanted to say this to get the picture and eventually we're going to get to the, the right slide. But uh, I'm going to, you have the presentation. Oh, yes, it's working, it's working. Okay. So after two, clicking, sorry, 20 times it works. Okay. Um, so the reality is that all the human suffering that these austerity measures cause is not needed because they are alternatives and they are feasible financing alternatives that exist even in the poorest countries. And these are nine, and we're going to go through them quickly. And we're going to stop perhaps in the two most remarkable ones for social security, and which are going to be progressive tax revenues and, and, so, and social protection. So the first one will be first option hmm, that countries have, and it will be to increase progressive tax revenues. How many, uh, how many of you were yesterday at the meeting with Georgieva in the IMF? Okay, so some of you were there. Now, it's very interesting because she hit some of the keywords, but, uh, but if you unfold it, uh, you know, the progressivity of what she suggests is not really there. Okay, so we have ordered the types of taxes from more progressive, which is what you want, to least progressive, which is what you really don't want. Huh? So at the bottom is actually consumptions or sales taxes, and this is what actually is the most common of the measures. You don't want that. And on the very top, it will be wealth taxes that Georgieva say that they are not going to be implemented by the IMF. Now, um, this is very interesting. Um, actually, wealth taxes are being proposed by a number of countries like my own, Spain, Iceland, Argentina. And they are very important. And why is important is not to focus only on personal income tax, because with that, you are going to be hammering mostly the middle classes. Income taxes are based on people that have as a regular salary at the end of the month. Okay, the very wealthy, the very rich don't have a salary. You know, they don't have an income. They actually have lots of money that comes from financial assets, real estate, and others. That's why you must tax wealth taxes. That will be the, the our objective. Then you could tax windfall profits. And this is happening in many countries in the energy sector. So it's not a dream or it's nothing, it's something very feasible. And the list is long and I put it on purpose. So from Algeria, Angola, Australia, Canada, Kazakhstan, Mauritania, blah, 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 blah. Many countries are doing that. And this is very important because these companies, companies had extraordinary profits at the time of the pandemic. So, it, you know, why not to cash in some of that? Then you could tax digital services like uh, companies selling online 
And that is actually uh, very feasible and is happening in a number of countries from Belgium, France, India, you name it. So many countries are doing that too, even Turkey. Um, then you will consider to tax um, corporations and the financial sector. The financial sector pays very little or no tax at all in the majority of countries. So we really need to go to con start considering how to get something from the financial sector um, and corporations. Then taxing natural resources extraction like oil, gas, and we have beautiful examples on social protection. Bolivia is paying, um, uh, Bolivia and Zambia are paying actually universal uh, pensions from, from mineral extraction and gas extraction. And Mongolia, Mongolia paid a universal child benefit from a little tax on copper exports. And that was sufficient to pay a, a benefit for all children in Mongolia, you know? And then you will go to personal income and you will go inheritance taxes, taxes on tourism, airlines, hotels. These are things that can be done. Uh, tariffs in for export sin taxes, like taxes on alcohol, cigarettes, you know, this type of thing. National lotteries, remittances, and consumption taxes, that is what you don't want to do. <laughs> okay. um, so, and also they have a negative impact on inflation that the IMF is so concerned. They're funny enough, they keep advising. Okay, so this is, long list so to say there's so many options that countries can take and the key thing is to focus on the top one no now it goes back <laughs> okay i don't know uh this is i have to do like that right very good yeah almost ah this is and this is something i think you are going to enjoy because the key thing, I mean, we are told the austerity mentality, virtually what it is, is that they are telling us, you know, there's no money. There's no money anywhere. So actually, we have to, you know, to, to, to be cutting spending, you know, and social spending. And it's going to be a temporary time. And then with time, you know, we'll develop public services and all. This is not true. Because this is really a world awash in money. There's so much money, okay? And it's really a lie. And what this graph is telling us, and it comes from a, from a consulting firm, very conservative, called Bain and Company. And it compares what is there. And I'm sorry it cannot be read properly. But um, what you have here, this, is the total financial assets of the world. And as you see, a lot. Um, on, red, on the top, financial holdings by banks and others. Uh, on blue color that you cannot see here because of the light, but in blue color, it will be the asset base of governments, you know, what governments have. Uh, there will be, you know, uh, you know, historical buildings, you know, you name it. Uh, uh, on, on top, um, um, on red, it will be the total GDP of countries that are produced. And in yellow, on very top, that you cannot see, uh, at all, it is actually the annual economic savings from austerity. So, and you tell me what they are getting. You cannot even see it. It's the very, very top yellow point. So what are all this social pain that is being caused by austerity? It has no logic when we have all these other sources of money and finance there that are untapped. So why to go for issues that have negative impacts? Yeah? Um, so that is very important to keep in mind. And I'm presenting this so in your own countries, you make the case, you know, so not a state just don't, don't accept that the reasoning that there is no money, there is a lot of money. Okay, so if it works again, we'll go. Option two, that was only option one, and it was increasing progressive tax collection. Option two will be to reduce debt. And there are many debt specialists here because we were we are at the annual meeting, so the IMF or the World Bank, I'm not going to go into that. There are many successful experiences of reducing debt, of restructuring in recent years. And it's important that we go ahead with them again because uh, debt is indeed a, a critical issue now. And the, the fundamental discussion here that I know many of you are involved with, it will be the issue of having an international mechanism to resolve this in 
in, in, you know, in equal terms, because at the moment creditors have all the power and are developing countries, they're just facing the, you know, so it's, it's very difficult. Um, so this debt workout mechanism, it needs to be established. And we'll pass again. The third will be to a third option that governments have is to eliminate illicit financial flows, and they are illegal, uh, like money laundering, like tax evasion, like uh, price, um, sorry, like trade mispricing between uh, corporations. Um, and this is a lot of money. Uh, and this is the first graph there. What you have is compares ODA, uh, that's development aid, that is really on black, the little black bar, and on blue is the, the taller bars. And these are the elite, illicit financial flows. The reality is a lot of money that is there in illegal activities. They are illegal and they must be fought. And the good news is that apparently Georgieva indicated that is a, a group working on that at the IMF. And let's hope that it comes to real policies. We are going to the fourth option, and this is extremely relevant for social security. And it will be the issue of um, ensuring first that employers are paying the right share, and that will be the adequate contributions. And at second, it will be to formalize workers in the, in the informal economy with wood contracts. Let's see if we get that uh, here. So there are very good examples of how to bring people in the informal economy to the formal. Um, and that will be through giving them a contract with good terms. And, and the, the grace, it, it requires a degree of subsidy from the government. Um, and we have very good experiences, like in Latin America, the monotax, what is called. And this is a simplified procedure by which companies, micro companies, micro enterprise, enterprises, declare the workers that they have, they give them a contract, and then they have access to social security. But the, the state actually pays the subsidy of the of social security. Um, and this is working very well for domestic workers, for you know, really small enterprises, and it's very, very good. And generally you get this type of agreements uh, through national dialogue. And You just need to be very aware of the attacks on social insurance and pension privatization. Um, the very interesting thing of that is that the, despite all the fanfare that the private sector comes and says on private pensions, of 192 countries, only 30 privatized pensions. This is very few number. Uh, they were only Latin America and Eastern Europe. Uh, well, except one in Africa, Nigeria. and. Um, so very, very few countries really privatized. And the second good news is that the majority of them reverse the privatization and then rebuilding the, the public system because it does not work. It does not work fiscally. It's extremely expensive to privatize. And it does not work socially. It's actually led to, so, so, to a lot of social unrest. Um, and people you know, have all age poverty increasing and huge gender disparities. Fifth option will be to reallocate public expenditures, and we have phenomenal good examples. For instance, Costa Rica and Thailand use expenditures on defense, on the military, uh, to expand the health sector. Uh, these were other times, though. What we're seeing today is an increase of defense spending at the cost of social protection, but we can fight it. Oh, keep working, keep working. <laughs> Okay, this is the fuel subsidies that my colleagues have talked, so I'm going to pass it. Uh, and it will be part of the allocation of public spending. Well, okay. The sixth option will be the use of reserves. Now, this is something that people don't know, but uh, central banks accumulate lots of reserves in a precautionary manner. Uh, and then the jargon of the IMF this week is to, to rebuild fiscal buffers. That's what they call it. And reality is that people might be actually starving outside. And it's, however, there's all this money in the central bank. Okay, and this is, there is a, um, an accepted measure, which is to have three or four months of imports as a precautionary measure. But countries have much more than that, than the three or four months of imports. Uh, 
Why? Partially they're doing that because they don't want an IMF loan, you know. <laughs> so they're keeping a lot of money to avoid the conditionalities that they will come uh, with the IMF. But, you know, this is all wrong. Also, there is the case of the sovereign wealth funds, that this is a bad idea because the, what you are doing there is putting money that belongs to the people into a stock exchange in, you know, in New York or in Frankfurt or who knows where, London. And you know, and when you could be spending it on development on people today, you know, so it would be better to do that. And I'm going to pass the slides very quickly because the time. This is sovereign wealth funds, and you know, this is money that belongs to the people and is being used in the stock exchange market. Market. Second, seventh option is um, a more accommod uh, more accommodating macroeconomic framework. But today, this is difficult because of the high inflation levels. So that's today's more difficult to sell. That means having some tolerance to inflation and to the to the fiscal deficit. Now, what happens is that the IMF thinks that economic stability is uh, inflation below five percent, and we know that macroeconomic stability might be twenty percent higher. But in the middle, you have a kind of gray zone that is there, but now it does not want to come. So, <laughs> because of the of the marker. It refuses to come. Yes, exactly. That will be uh, the gray zone. But anyway, um, today is a more difficult sell. So we keep on going if it wants. Farah, I think I need your help. Anyway, and um, so virtually, this will be the main the main options. And if we don't if we don't continue, it does not matter. Now the thing is, how you discuss that with government. You could get a group of civil society people uh, with some economists and go and talk to your Ministry of Finance, to your parliament. But the best thing you can do is actually to call for national dialogue because this is what good governance requires. Okay, there's regulated how to do national social dialogue. So you actually call it and then you will require, it should be attended by free trade unions, by representative civil society organizations, by federated employers, not just an employer like Elon Musk giving his opinion. That would be federated employers in an association of employers representing them. It's okay, this is gone, so that's fine. And then you will get everybody sitting there together in a public dialogue that will put all the options. So you, you say, Okay, you are suggesting to do all these cuts on public services, on social protection, etc. But we have these financing alternatives. So let's agree on a best option. And that has worked in many countries successfully. In others, not so well. So it depends how you know the government is and how rooted the democratic institutions are. But, um, but that is the way forward. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the three of you. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, uh, uh, Imen, and thank you, Shirin. Um, please get your questions ready. But right before that, I'm going to ask one question just to kick off the discussion panel. Do you think that there is a room for, um, in a way, a competition between the staff position within the IMF and the political uh, part of it, uh, the board and the country representatives? Like this, is there? I mean, the managing director is the representative of the board before being the representative of staff. But we do not listen; we do not hear that often. But is there a room for, like, interacting with the the different uh, trends, maybe that that are within the IMF, the different entities? Yeah, the political one and more the tech uh, technocratic one. So if there is, who would like to? Um, I mean, like, if I, I if I understand your question, you're asking about the <clears throat> the relationship between the board of directors and the management, right? So, yeah, basically, you, you advocate thinking about uh, different strategies to advocate when you have different uh, Spaces. stakeholders. One is political and representing countries and state members, and the other is more technocratic. Yes. I mean, like, um, yes, there's two different spaces, but those two different spaces are are very related. Um, and there is, and we know as civil society who is using those spaces that there is some topics that we 
can raise with the management, but uh, uh, there's other topics that we raise with the with the board. And yes, there is spaces to advocate and to raise your. Yani, I was just coming uh, heading here from the uh, a meeting with the European uh, EDs on the of the IMF, and there wa was also and this is uh, an of an off record meeting that usually happened during the annual and the um, and the spring meetings. But also there is other uh, spaces uh, uh, if you want to interact with the EDs, for example. Uh, through our colleagues on here on Friedrich Ebert, we had uh, 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 a chance to meet with the social democratic representative at the Bundestag to speak about surcharge, for example. And at the beginning of the year, I had a chance to uh, uh, to speak about the World Bank Evolution Road Bank at the the uh, the Social and Economic Committee at the Bundestag. So there is a space, and of course, the 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 the, the German AD was there. He's speaking. I'm speaking from the so he's speaking from the World Bank. So there is, of course, spaces, and we can use the spaces. This is always uh, there, even if if those spaces are always off record spaces, specifically for the IMF. The IMF doesn't have a specific policy for citizen engagement um, at all. I mean, the World Bank has a citizen engagement policy. Mm -mm -mm -mm. It's another story. We there's a lot of concerns uh, around this this uh, policy, but they have a policy. The IMF doesn't have a policy to engage with the citizen, uh, uh, with the civil society, uh, even 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 when they are doing, for example, because you we are usually interact with the mm, management, especially on the uh, on the the country representatives in our countries like. In Morocco, in Tunisia, in Lebanon, not not in Lebanon now, but I mean, like, will be hope. I don't know, but anyway, I mean, you, we usually interact with the uh, country directors or the country representatives, uh, the mission chiefs they call them or the representative of mission chief. We usually interact with them at the Article Four review, yeah. and but even this, it's not an, an uh, it's not a complete, uh, uh, yani, uh, a mandate. It is related to how the chief mission himself uh, assume. Yes, they has to check that they cons not con it's not a, it's not a consultation uh, as the World Bank discourse, but it's a meeting to to grab out the recommendations on Article Four. So, but the problem is not in the spaces. On the spaces, the problem is how those spaces can be effective. This is the question. I mean, how we can use those space, spaces on our own benefit, how we want to uh, 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 raise our voice in our own discourse, how we want to change policies uh, 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 and unfairness through those spaces. This is the, the, the question, not, not the spaces. They are there and they will, they will be happy to engage with us to say that hmm, we have a fruitful engagement for the civil society, but then what? So it's, it's something actually that we need to discuss among, among us here as experts, researchers, civil society, advocators, what, how we can use, how we can use those spaces in a more effective way. I hope I, I answered your question. Thank you, yeah, you did. And there's another question that was, uh, yes. Okay, uh, thank you all for, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you all for the very interesting presentations. My name is Osama Diab. I'm an economics uh, researcher. And I would like to comment on the point made by Isabel on uh, how small the fiscal savings are of austerity. And that in a way this makes it illogic, like or purposeless. Uh, and I disagree because I think there's another purpose. And I think if we start thinking of the IMF not as a technical institution, because we tend to think of the IMF as a technical institution, and then we can look at this and say it doesn't make any sense. But I think if we think of the IMF as a political institution that defends the interests of a specific social class, then it would make a lot of sense. Actually, I did a research uh, recently on the elimination of energy subsidies in Egypt, and this confirms uh, your hypothesis. Uh, because when we looked at it, it didn't actually lead to a lot of fiscal savings because it caused a lot of inflation because energy 
when you remove it because it's an input in every single product so it increases inflation a lot of everything across the board inflation and then when you have inflation you need to increase the interest rates significantly now in egypt it's above 20 percent uh, the interest rates and this increases the interest payments of the government because the government is the biggest borrower so now the interest payments alone in in egypt is 10 percent of the gdp even more i think now it would be more and it's almost half of budget spending is interest payments. So when we did the calculations, we found out that the fiscal savings caused by the elimination of energy subsidies was 4.5%, but it indirectly led to a 3% increase in interest payments. So in reality, the effective of the real or the real fiscal saving was only 1.5% of GDP. So it's not worth all the social suffering that uh, that was caused by the elimination of energy subsidies. But it makes complete sense when you look at it from the terms of upward mobility of wealth, because this money used to go to actually benefit lower income and middle income uh, households. And now they just go to the top 1% of local and foreign investors in the form of interest payments. So. I know from a technical point of view, it doesn't make much sense. It's kind of illogical, but if we think of it politically, and you know, we should not shy away, I think, from class analysis when we, uh, we, uh, when we analyze uh, these trends. Sometimes I understand I, the IMF puts us in this technical box, but I think we, we, this is also something we need to resist and push back against. Thank you. Okay, so. Okay, sorry, I'm juggling many things. Yes. أولا أشكر الصديقات والصديق العزيز وكذلك يعني أشد على أيادي شيرين على هذه الدعوة الكريمة وعلى هذا النقاش الحر والمسؤول فقط أريد أن أضيف بأننا رغم المحاولاتنا المتعددة لكي نتناول موضوع تقشف من زاوية النوع الاجتماعي وأطاره على اللامساواة أو ما يسمى بالمساواة الجندرية فنحن ما زلنا نتعدد نتحدث في العام ولا نتحدث في الخاص بمعنى آخر وخاصة أستاذة ذكرت سبعة ديال المحاولات ديال أننا نقلص من سياسة التقشف ولم ننتبه إلى أن ربما اقتصاد رعاية الإيكونومي كير كير إيكونومي كل المجهودات التي تقوم بها النساء فيما يسمى باقتصاد الرعاية هي محاولات لتقديم خدمات خدمات بالمجال لا تعترف بها الدولة ولا تقوم حتى باحتسابها لا في الناتج الخام الوطني ولا باحتسابها كذلك في كل هذا الحماية الاجتماعية وغيرها وغيرها مثلا سمعتم بأسطورة أن المغرب بدأ يعمم ما يسمى بالحماية الاجتماعية عن أي تعميم نتحدث نحن نعرف بأن غالبية الناس رجالا ونساء اللي في المناطق النائية عندما سمع أسطورة أن سيكون هناك دعم مباشر قاموا بتسجيل ولكن عندما رأوا أن هناك العديد من المشاكل بدأوا في مطالبة بسحب التسجيل سحب تسجيلاتهم في هذه الآدات والأدوات الديجيتال يعني في هذا الداتا الداتا في السجل الاجتماعي شكرا صديق العزيز في السجل الاجتماعي بدأوا إذن وبدأن يعني أطلب منكم زعما صدقا أن نزور جميعا نعمل على تفكير في كيفية إقامة بحث ميداني مثلا أدعوكم إلى أن نزور أحد المناطق التي تضررت بفعل الزلزال اللي هي المنطقة ديال تارودانت منطقة تارودانت تعطينا ما يسمى بأجواد زيت في العالم وزيت أرقان زيت أرقان يباع في جميع مناطق العالم على أساس أنه زيت للبشرة وللأكل وغيرها وكذلك لمنافعه إن زيت أرقان التعاونية التي تقوم بغالبيتها نسائية مية في المية أصبحت ثمرة الأرقان تباع لشركات قب تباع لشركات عابرة للحدود والفروي ديال الشجر يعني هذه التمار 
حتى واحد ما كيعرفها مني بدينا كنفكروا في العمليه ديال التعميم الحمايه الاجتماعيه توسعت الى ما يسمى بهذا لي كوبيراتيف ولكن النساء التي تعمل على القطف هي متضرره من تغيرات المناخيه الشمس الشتاء البرد متضرره من ساعات الاقارب يعني كت متضرره جديدا لان ليس هناك امان في الطريق اللي غادي تمشي باش تجيب ذاك المحصول تقدر تتعرض لتحرش وغيرها وغيرها اذا نرى بان في هذا لاشين دو سيرفيس ليس فقط التعاونيه التضررات ليست فقط باننا اصبحنا عوض ان نقول يجب مساعده التعاونيات ولي بوتي تي مويان اونتربريز اصبحنا نضرب هذه المؤسسات التي هي اقرب للشرائح الاجتماعيه فعن اي حمايه نتحدث شيرين قالت سانتهي شيرين قالت يجب ان نفكر في اليات اخرى للضغط الحوار الذي قمنا به والذي ما زلنا نقوم به اثره صفر اثره صفر بدعوى ان لاحظنا خطه البنك الدولي نلاحظ استمرار في ضرب السياسات الاجتماعيه اذا بحكم الخبرة ديالكم ما هي البدائل هل هي البدائل المتواجدة في أننا يجب أن نفكر جميعا في أجندات 2030 على أساس أننا نعيد النظر في الشراكة العالمية في الهدف 17 هل يجب أن نفكر في آليات أخرى أظن بأنه آن الأوان أن نفكر بالصوت المرتفع ونقول من بين أن نقول من بين الأهداف التنموية التي يجب أن نشتغل عليها في أهداف التنمية الـ17 أن نشتغل على لانديس ديال التقشف هذا إذا فكرنا معنا في القاعة ربما ديزيكونوم معنا ناس اللي يشتغلوا كثير إذا إذا فكرنا بأننا نفكر في داتا مرتبطة بالتقشف ربما شكراً شكراً على هذه الإضافة وشكراً على المشاركة التجربة هذه وعلى الاقتراح اللي قمت به واللي مشيت فعله معاه المتدخلين عندنا أه أسأل شكون يتفضل و... تفضل شكراً طيب شكرا لحضراتكم جميعا كل اللي على المنصه انا مش عارفه مداخلتي خلينا اقول ان هي فضفضه اكتر من ان هي مداخله يعني خلينا نقول ان هي مداخله عامه لانه طول الوقت لما مصر بتاخد قروض من من صندوق النقد ازاي ده بيأثر بسبب الشروط على الفقراء اكتر وعلى الفئات المهمشه بالعرض اللي عرضته ايزابيل بالخيارات اللي هي طرحتها كانت طول الوقت مع كل خيار انا بتذكر كل الـ الـ السياسات اللي بتحصل في مصر ويمكن اهمها الخيار اللي اتكلمت فيه على الجزء الخاص ب عندنا في مصر يعني بيقولوا عليه معاشات الضمان الاجتماعي لانه لما اتحط كل المعاشات تحت المظله اللي اسمها تكافل وكرامه اللي انا مش شايفه فيها بحقيقي ريحه الكرامه لانه بعد شويه انا كان عندي فئات بيحصلوا على معاشات مختلفه وكان عندهم يعني رولز كده معينة بيتمشي عليها وبعدها بيحصلوا على المعاش على طول على سبيل المثال معاش كان اسمه معاش المطلقات كانت الست بعد فترة العدة وانه لو هي كمان واخدة الحكم عن طريق المحكمة بتعدي فترة الاستئناف الى اخره وبتقدم وبتحصل على المعاش دلوقتي اللي حصل انه كله بقى تحت مظلة تكافل وكرامة ونتيجة لده هي بقت تدخل في الدور اللي ممكن ما يجيش عليها غير بعد سنتين ثلاثة دي حاجة الحاجة الثانية انه أكبر مبلغ بي بي بيتم الحصول عليه للعيلة هو أكبر مبلغ تقريبا 550 جنيه يعني اللي هو 16 أو 17 دولار مثلا في ده ده, ده كمان إيه إنه عيلة مثلا يكون فيها معاق ممكن عيلة يبقى فيها معاق على فيها مطلقة على فيها مرأة معيلة على فيها أطفال بتتعلم وفي النهاية أنا بقول لهم هو ده 16 أو 17 دولار فهي أنا ما عنديش حلول بس ولا يعني بس هرجع تاني للي شيرين قالته في عرضها فكرة ماذا بعد يعني إيه البدايل مهم نبقى كلنا بنفكر في ده وأتمنى أن احنا نطلع بحاجة خلينا ناخذ للتوازن ناخذ سؤال من عند الأخ وننطلقوا في الإجابة أوكي؟ It's balanced <تصفيق> خلينا نشرفوا بيك. مساء الخير جميعا انس الحسناوي مؤسسه فريدريش ابرت بالمغرب ثلاث ملاحظات على السريع اولا سياق لقائنا اليوم اعتقد 
الاجتماعات الحاصله اليوم اظنها في واد ونحن في واد الاجتماعات اطارات خاصه باهلها وباصحابها وتحاول ان تناقش مصير المتحكمين في هذه الاليات وبالتالي منذ سنوات وانا اعيش انطلاقا اعتقد من ازمه 2008 مرورا عبر كوفيد محاوله لاغراء المجتمع المدني حتى يصبح طرفا مناقشا لاولويات هاتين المؤسستين ولا وهذه المحاوله في تلميع الصوره للمؤسستين اعتقد لها محدوديتها لانه يرجع الينا كذلك في كل لحظه على ان هذه حكوماتكم هي التي تقرر داخل هذه المؤسسات وليس نحن من يقرر ولذلك ارجع الى ما قاله الصديق قبل قليل ان المساله في عمقها سياسيه بالاساس المساله الثانيه هو نقاش الموضوع اعتقد ما قاله اورتيز قبل قليل فيما يتعلق بالمعطيات انا اعتقد نحن في حاجه كمجتمع مدني بشكل خاص والمؤسسات التي تشتغل على هذا الموضوع من خارج مؤسسه الماليه محتاجه بشكل قوي لتقويه سندها الترفعي عبر هذا النوع من العمل يعني العلمي البحثي واشكرها على كذلك الافاق التي رسمتها مساله سواء اخيره كنت اود ان تكون تجربة المغربيه حاضره هنا خصوصا ان المغرب يتوفر اليوم داخل المجتمع المدني على مرصد اسمه المرصد المغربي للحمايه الاجتماعيه راكمت تجربه من المعرفه الكافيه واهم شيء لماذا اقول هذا لاننا نتوفر اليوم في المغرب على استراتيجيه هذه الاستراتيجية أكيد أخذت بعين الاعتبار مجموعة من الملاحظات فيما يتعلق بطبيعة بعض الأشكال ديال الحماية الاجتماعية لكنها وصلت في محطة معينة إلى كيف سيتم تنزيل هذه الاستراتيجية وهي مرتبطة بهذا السجل الاجتماعي المحد كيفية التفعيل هي التي ستعطي حقيقة صورة إذا كانت هناك حصل تطور وهذا ينطبق على مجموعة من البلدان ليس على المغرب ولذلك أعتقد تعدد فضاءات الاشتغال المتعدد الأطراف وحدة ثانيا التوفر على المعرفة العلمية من أجل تقوية السند نقطتين أساسيتين وشكرا شكرا جزيلا لك آه الكلمة لكم آه نبدأ إيزابيل Would you like to react on some? Uh... Some people are burning to ask questions. Yeah, but the, we have four questions already asked, so. Okay, well, thank you very much for all the very interesting questions. Um, I agree with all of them. <laughs> so, so what can I do is only to compliment them. I do believe uh, that the IMF does pro-reach policies, and it's funny because with in. You know, years ago, it came this thing that policies had to be pro-poor. In reality, all these policies do benefit investors, and um, and certainly not the majority of people. And this is this was not at the beginning in the IMF. If you look at the Articles of Constitution of the institution, the Article One it calls the IMF to look for growth with jobs, and however, they only look at the Article Four, which is inflation. And why? Because inflation is more convenient for investors. Um, so, um, so indeed, and you could argue that at the moment uh, the, the IMF is doing foreign economic policy for the US. Uh, and that links with the original question that you were putting of divergences within the IMF. Uh, indeed, I think there are many divergences in the board of directors, particularly developing countries are, you know, they have different vision and they will want more votes, more voting power that the US and the Europeans don't want to give up. <laughs> so, yes, indeed. I they really appreciate your comment on gender and the care economy. And this is true. Uh, more should have been here um, on the, the IMF did release a gender strategy, approve a gender strategy, but it's very insufficient. So it says it acknowledges gender issues, which is good. But then when there is says when there is um, when women may be disadvantaged, the IMF will do a mitigation program. Generally, will be an, a safety net. 
uh, you know, women are 50% of the population. You do a safety net only targeted to a few poor. This is does not solve the problem. You know? So it's again the problem of these policies are pro-rich. They are not uh, policies for the people. And I really enjoy, um, I'm very glad to, that Morocco has a national observatory for public spending and social protection. And these type of, of instruments, as the gentleman was saying, are essential for national dialogue. So this will be a good point to start. Yeah, I, I, I will react very quickly on um, our friend from Egypt. And this is why I didn't present our reports in details because we are leaving this. I saw the room, the majority are coming from the region and we, it's, they um, uh, is is like a myth, and um, also the amount of cash transfers are are meaningless. Especially that inflation is mainly coming from uh, the um, uh, the increase of our our um, domestic currencies. Um, so I I believe that this is an opportunity to coordinate together to to think how we can we can face this how to to can we um, bring more evidence or I don't know how we we can we can push to 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 change these policies. Thank you, Iman. Shirin, maybe you would you like to add before the second round of questions? Yes, yes I want to answer the question uh, of Khadija and the lady from Seula. What's next? How we can do this? Um, first, we need to, uh, they need to admit and we need to understand that the multilateral system actually uh, uh, is becoming a, a, a failure. And it needs to be uh, reformed. This is first. Reform it in terms of uh, 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 of, of governance, re re reform in terms of structure. Yes. But another important thing that it's also our responsibility to make that this course of uh, uh, economical justice a daily uh, story. We have to speak about economical justice. We have to, re to relate economical justice to bread. We have to speak with our with our mothers, with our uh, uh, people about econo economical justice as uh, 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 a daily discussion. Not only, and this is also the the, the new liberal. Uh, <coughs> this is how the new liberal. Uh, 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 approaches with ruling uh, our minds to make this economical justice discourse only uh, uh, related to the experts, the elite. It's no, it's uh, economical justice is human rights. So everything, and, and I, yes, I agree, everything is political. Human rights is political too. Uh, second, uh, third, it has to come from here, and I'm going to say this in Arabic. Lazim nibda min hena. ولازم نبتدي هم بيتبنوا الديسكورس بتاعنا بعد 2011 وبالمناسبه صندوق النقد الدولي من المؤسسات اللي ابتدت تغير وتقول لك ايكواليتي يا جماعه فجاه بعد 2011 ما كانوش بيقولوا ترانسبيرنسي يا جماعه ما كانوش بيقولوا كده بعد 2011 معنى ذلك انه 2011 امر جلل مش هم مش محتاجين احنا مش محتاجينهم يبرروا لنا انه امر جلل هو امر جلل هو امر جلل وفات فات 10 سنين من 2011 12 سنه في تاريخ الثورات ولا حاجه انما احنا كمان لازم نتعلم من ال10 سنين اللي فاتوا ونتعلم من اللحظه من المومنتم بتاع 2011 انه هم اه بيستخدموا مصطلحاتنا كمجتمع مدني لكن احنا كمان لازم نطور مصطلحاتنا محتاجين نتكلم شويه على 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 على, على الاحتلال محتاجين نتكلم على تفكيك الاحتلال وتفكيك الموروث الاحتلالي والموروث الاستعماري انا اسفه المور... عشان انا بترجم في دماغي الموروث الاستعماري اللي بسببهم احنا موجودين في سيفير ديت في في ازمه مديونيه كبيره اللي بسبب الموروث هذا هذا الموروث الاستعماري احنا بنعاني النهارده موجودين النهارده هم قاعدين بيقولوا 
بيبرروا وبيمرروا وسمتايمز بيستخدمونا احنا كمان محتاجين نغير الديسكورس بتاعنا محتاجين نبطل نقول في لحظه انا في رايي يعني وانا يمكن اي اي جاست ديفلوب ذس ريسنتلي برضو القناعه دي ان احنا نبطل نقول بدائل لانه هذا النظام فاشل النظام ده مش محتاج بدائل بل يحتاج الى تغيير جذري لازم نقول ترانسفورميشن مش بخض ريستراكشرينج شكرا 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 لك يا شيرين آه رضوى من بعد سيد مين رضوى؟ اه ما بعرفها سوري رضوى Um, thank you very much uh, for all the colleagues and all the inputs that have been very thought-provoking. Uh, Radwan Khaled from Medico International, um, advisor for uh, transformative aid. And I want to pull further on the question of how political it is. Because as you said, uh, Shireen, that when we speak about social protection and when we speak about universal uh, social protection, universal um, uh, medical, um, uh, medical care and so on and so forth, We are speaking about actually a restructuring and a rethinking and a re-implementing of um, the whole economic system. And I'm quite surprised when I see in the alternatives that, for example, taxations should be that, for example, exact, uh, extractivist uh, measures are to be taxed so we can achieve um, economical justice or, uh, let's say, better um, social protection. Social protection in a world in which whole parts of countries are drowning. We've seen that in Libya, we've seen that in Pakistan. And I mean, if, for example, also man, uh, mentioned Mozambique. Mozambique is one of the cases where there were debt cuts in 2005. The debt cuts didn't result specifically in a better economic justice or better economic system. Rather, it resulted into secret loans. It resulted into Cabo Delgado, terrorism. Uh, in which civil society is not able to actually um, protect women or children or anyone else in that uh, uh, space or in that uh, territory. And the military is protecting Shell and Total who are doing extractivist um, measures in those spaces. Um, so here, first of all, paying backs, yes, and not, um, not only because of the colonial era, this is coming from pre-colonial times as well in the transcontinental trade. We need uh, another discussion on uh, rights and we need acuteness because uh, we don't live in a time in which we are again going into liberal modes of um, fixing wounds and then again. So we actually, I think, need a radical, more radical approach, even as CSOs also might be liberal in their um, DNA. Thank you. Thank you, Radwa. Uh, since so, and uh, yeah, and Mr. Okay, please go on. And then, and then we'll have, have two men. Yeah. So, Muhammad. Yes, Salma. The last one, Salma, please. Thank you, Mr. My question is uh, for Isabel mainly. Um, one of the alternatives that we should always talk about, especially in the South, is uh, making more uh, wider fiscal space through um, cutting the interest rates. Because we always get this uh, advice from the IMF to uh, raise interest rates uh, to curb inflation. Due to the devaluation, so it's and curbing and and yeah and and raise, raising interest rates actually affects our uh, cost of borrowing. So you would, it, all all the countries all over the world are uh, facing very high deficits, fiscal deficits, but not all of them pay a lot of interest on their debts. So this is like uh, it's very specific to the to the South countries countries in the south so i think that tackling this issue is is very important for instance this year in 2023 in egypt one percent cut of interest rate would make 70 billion pounds in um, in fiscal space this is the calculations of the government this is the official calculation so we, we're talking about 20 billion dollars yeah like two billion dollars just from one percent cut of the interest rate. So uh, I think this makes for more than tripling the 
CCT programs, the cash transfer programs, mm -hmm. and it can double the, the, the health uh, budget in Egypt in one year. So thank you. Thank you. So we get your point. We have three questions left and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll close. So uh, the two gentlemen in the back end, sir, here. طيب انا شريف من مصر انا عايز بس اسال صندوق النقد والبنك الدولي 79 سنه محتاج اعرف ايه التجارب اللي نجح فيها في اي بلد من البلاد <تصفيق> عشان نبتدي نتكلم في السياسات صندوق النقد بيلعب دور ما بين انظمه مستبده هي بتاخد قروض بتأثر على الفقراء واللي بيدفع فاتورة التقشف هم الفقراء بطريقة كبيرة جدا ويعني دعم الكهرباء عندنا في مصر 20% على الأغنية و 80% من فاتورة رفع الدعم بيدفعها الفقراء التكافل وكرامة بيغطي نص عدد الفقراء في مصر وبطريقة ربع دولار لكل فرد في الأسرة يأكل بيها ويشرب بيها ويتعلم بيها ويعمل كل حاجة بيها ورغم عن ذلك هو بيغطي نص آه ورغم عن ذلك هو بيغطي نص العدد وكمان هو بيساعد على نهب الدول الغنية للموارد والصراوات بتاعتنا إحنا المواني تباعت الشركات تباعت كل حاجة تباعت للدول اللي هي بتدفع لصندوق النقد عشان يقدر يعمل هذه السياسات وبالتالي أنا شايف إحنا عندنا ثلاث استراتيجيات مهمة إحنا بنشتغل عليه استراتيجية الأولى إحنا إزاي نحاول نحسن من الشروط مع إسقاط بعض الديون للحاجة الموجودة إحنا بنتعامل مع أمر واقع لازم نتعامل مع تحسين شروط وإسقاط ديون الجزء الثاني إزاي إحنا نشتغل جوا بلادنا بشكل حقيقي إن يبقى عندنا أنظمة حماية اجتماعية شاملة مش عبارة عن برامج جزئية للفقراء اللي احنا محتاجين نديهم اي حاجة عشان نسكتهم الحاجة الثالثة ان احنا ازاي يبقى في نظام عالمي بديل بتاع صندوق النقد الدولي ولازم نفكر بشكل استراتيجي ده لانه طول ما هو موجود طول ما الشعوب بتزيد من الفقر وطول ما الفقراء بيملوا الدنيا كلها شكرا, شكرا جدا شكرا لك وممكن ايوب في الخلف Thank you. Uh, my name is Ayub Minzli. I'm a political economist from Tunisia. Actually, I have a comment that uh, is, is related to the agenda setting power of the IMF. And while I agree that, for example, focusing on progressive policies, whether to social prote uh, protection, whether to fiscal policy, it's great. But I think we also need to think beyond that and not let that agenda be forced upon us because there are structural problems that are go beyond uh, the IMF and their conditionalities. And uh, for example, the debt crisis, whether it's in Tunisia or a lot of the global South countries, they're mostly due to causes that we have no control over. It's COVID, Ukraine war, its impact on uh, prices of energy and food, a rising of interest rates of the Federal Reserves. These are something we cannot control. What we can do though, is we can reduce our um, dependencies on, 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 on imports, for example, so we have more resiliency against resilience against external shocks when these things happen. We have to address the unequal exchanges between uh, when it comes to trade, uh, when it comes to our exports and agricultural products that are mostly low added value, our industries, um, um, uh, phosphates in the case of Tunisia, but raw material in general in the case of, of, of other countries. And so uh, I think this is also important to take into consideration and not just solely focus on 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 but IMF conditionality, which which I agree are extremely important and, and they're very urgent since they're short-term programs that will impact the lives of a lot of people immediately, but we should not be restricted uh, in that sense. And I know this has usually two barriers in general that are mostly political and political economy barriers. Uh, I think it was it's also extremely important to know the, the importance of, of coalition building, because I feel beyond academic circles or civil society circles, uh, these things are not carried by any political movement. Uh, even within trade unions, these are not ideas that are very common. And so I think broadening coalitions within our countries to make this message go through and then to actually act upon um, these policies. And one final point I think we also should take into consideration regarding any attempt at reform is that uh, in Tunisia, but in also other countries, there are a 
enormous concentration of capital and power in the hands of very few individuals and very few economic groups that influence heavily uh, political decisions. And this is the case also in Morocco and Egypt and a lot of other countries. Now, any progressive policies will un undoubtedly either reduce the wealth and consequently the power of these individuals. And so we'll have a lot of pushback against it. And so it's also important to consider these questions and how to address them and navigate these political economy barriers. I hope that wasn't too long. Uh, it was very interesting. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so did yeah, there was uh, the lady in the second, and then yeah, the sir, the, the gentleman here. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, the good um, news is that, sorry for interrupting, the good news is that Iman said that we have more time for discussion so and for questions, so please. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just, I'm oh, sorry, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Daisy Simon, and uh, I'm a social protection specialist uh, with Development Pathways. Uh, here representing Development Pathways and also ISSPF, which is a, a civil society uh, platform and forum uh, for the MENA region. Um, yeah, just thank you so much. It was really great to hear uh, all of your interventions. I think just to sort of contribute to this point that's come out in the discussion as well about really reinforcing the kind of political nature of these decisions and moving away from this being a technocratic forum that happens in these sort of uh, technocratic rooms, like we've seen uh, so, so far today. Uh, we've just come, come from the annuals, um, but really reinserting politics into the question and looking at actually what's already there and what national governments have already financed. So Isabel's sort of point about, you know, this big problem of fiscal space, there's not enough money, but looking actually countries already have started investing their money in, in policies and, and social protection approaches that they see as politically feasible and valuable uh, for, for, their, for their national context. So I'm, I'm writing a paper at the moment, which is just uh, simply documenting the universal programs that are already and it press so much about the, the uh, universal programs for high income countries only when you get to that stage of development. But there's actually uh, 85 programs that I've, I've found so far uh, across low and middle income countries, uh, mainly pensions. Uh, and these are universal, so non income tested, non means tested, or benefit uh, tested. So part of sort of multi tiered social protection systems. So I just wanted to sort of make this point of let's sort of also highlight what already exists and what's really sweeping and 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 really quite um, profound is that of course all of these are government financed. <laughs> so even you know there's not really a strong correlation looking at these between level of wealth of countries and level of investment. Uh, so you can see even countries like Nepal, a low income country is it's about political will. It's decided to to make this investment. Uh, so perhaps Sort of a comment, but also a question is is really we maybe we should be thinking about again these sort of political economy dimensions and thinking about what types of approaches uh, and and systems um, really will support uh, effective domestic resource mobilization strategies and looking at what countries actually want to invest in and perhaps uh, IFI is getting behind supporting those existing initiatives uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for the contribution. Thank you very much. I'm Luis with the Bretton Woods Project. I have more of a comment than a question. I'm sorry <laughs> to say that. But I think I'm trying to link a few points. And uh, for those of you, I know at least some of you won't maybe come as a surprise, but I think we also need to talk about how the global economy has changed since, you know, at least the 80s. Isabel mentioned that, you know, Article 1 is actually quite potentially powerful but is kind of, you know, fallen by the wayside. And you have to think to yourself, well, what has happened? And this links into the political economy and the economy and the actual structure of the economy. I think we really, it behooves us to think about how financial capital has changed the fun its function in the economy and the role it plays in the economy. You know, this relates to all these questions. We tend to think of the IMF, which, you know, I'm not saying it's not correct, but I think the, the perspective of the multilateral system as being only comprised of states, as state actors negotiating amongst themselves for outcomes, is it's not it lacks depth, right? Because you have financial capital pervades all is a, a gigantic non-state actor, and when you think about the IMF, the IMF is also bound by the signals that it sends finance capital and it forces 
states to send those very same signals at the state level, right? So, and I mean, it's pick it up on the point from our Tunisian colleague. This this generates el elites in the global south that have financial elites that have a a, a stake in the, the status quo. So I, I think the north-south divide is useful to a certain degree because it's still there. Obviously, it's there in the governance structures. It's there in, in the fact that most multinationals are headquartered in in, uh, in Europe, North America, etc., and now in, in China. But for example, uh, uh, and this relates to the idea of, you, I, I agree with your analysis about there are things that are beyond our control. I don't necessarily agree with your analysis that the debt crisis, it, may, it has been exacerbated by COVID and Ukraine, but it was pre-existing. Why? Because states don't, haven't had the capacity to utilize industrial policy to get themselves out of this unequal, unequal trade, uh, terms of trade. And I'll, I'll finish in two seconds. So, for example, I'll give an example. Sure, sure, sorry. So, you look at Brazil, for example, and another question about interest rates. When Dilma, my, our former president, was in power, she really began a process to try to reindustrialize Brazil except that her, for that she needed cheap, uh, cheap credit. Instead, the central bank raised interest rates. And, and, finance, and the finance capital, even industrial capital in Brazil decided it's actually it's more profitable because demand is so uh, depressed in Brazil. It's more profitable for us to invest in finance and, and than it is for us in, in, the, in the productive economy. And I'm gonna make a link here to the discussion on social protection. In Brazil and other countries, what happens? You decrease state capacity to provide social protection. What happens? People, and then the IMF and others and states incentivize citizens to begin relying on, on finance services. Brazil people pay for education and help, not help so much because Brazil has a decent health system, but you know, you, be, you, you become in better in a financial system in credit, et cetera. So, you know, I think we really need to maybe step back and analyze how the, the changing world of finance plays into this and, and um, you know, constrains not only state action, but also multilateral action. Thanks, I hope that's useful or thought provoking at least, thanks. Can I use some privilege and ask a question? <laughs> I know it's like malicious. <laughs> a very, very quick question. And it's on something very particular that Dr. Ortiz mentioned, which is related to the sovereign wealth funds. My question to you is, should we be against, or should we speak against the sovereign wealth funds in the absolute, or is it that we need such funds and they're part of what is called solidarity financing, but in the case that we need those funds, we should be diversifying our investment, por investment portfolios and should be managing the money responsibly so that when we need the funds, then the priority is to pay the people and not to keep them in the stock market. And does this, a comment that you mentioned on social wealth funds, does it apply to uh, solidarity equalization funds, other forms of mutual funds, and uh, you know what I mean, and solidarity kinds of funds, because there, there are many. Uh, and in, uh, in Jordan, for instance, during COVID-19, they had one, one that was called the Himat Watan Solidarity Fund, and it was led by the state. It wasn't like an informal. So my question to you, are these good or bad? That is the bottom line. And thanks for allowing me. Thank you so much for the mic and for organizing and helping logistically and technically. Um, we have a good batch of questions. Seven, I think that if you could make sure that, uh, I'll try to make sure that all the questions are uh, uh, responded to at least, or uh, you have a reaction on it. So please. Oof, there's so many questions, and they were all very interesting. Um, some were comments, which I agree, actually, with all of them. And I don't even know how to start, because we could start going into one or another. But OK, I'm going to pick one. And it's the issue of the agenda setting of the IMF and uh, the need to actually go to longer term issues. I fully agree. I fully agree, uh, and not just uh, with IMF, uh, with countries. And by the way, Luis mentioned Brazil. Brazil tried to open a Ministry of Long-Term Development, and it was closed down. And so this is much needed. We all need to have this long-term view. But I'm afraid to say that we also need to fight the short-term 
daily things too, because some of these reforms that they are doing in the name of austerity actually have long-term implications. Let's say that they privatize the health sector or pensions. And actually, this is very difficult to reverse. It can be done, it can be reversed, but it will take years. And a decision that is taken in one day and precipitated because of some fiscal issue, then it will have would be very difficult to to fight. So I'm afraid we need to fight the short term, the medium, and the long term. You know, all of the terms, and and with with a lot of effort, as all of you were saying. Um, perhaps I I the sovereign of, there are many funds. Sovereign wealth funds are only a type of fund. Um, and the sovereign wealth funds are all invested in capital markets. And let me put an example, the example of Timor-Leste. Timor-Leste is a country very, very poor. And actually, you look at the Human Development Report, Timor-Leste appears at the bottom, you know. And however, Timor-Leste has billions of dollars invested overseas, you know. So why, why, when people are so poor, the arguments to bring this investments to the people and to the economy today are enormous, uh, not just there. There are other type of funds, not all is the same. Um, so then it's when you will have to, to draw the line. I think I'm going to, to keep things apart with it. Yeah, thank you. I think for the comments uh, who were for me, I think we can we can have discussion outside. I don't have anything. To it's 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 actually a lot of frustration to have this question, but I don't have any solution. The only solution is to continue fighting, to um, to continue coordinating, to to see, and also to work at local level. I don't I I, I don't have any magic solution. No, I, I I really don't want to end it with frustration because because it's it's not. I mean, like we cannot afford frustration now. Um, I know that the the we we had a, we had a very funny funny meeting with the Mena EDs at the IMF. It was really funny because they were speaking when we were speaking about uh, fiscal consultations. They were they were speaking uh, that is for the long term system. Long term what? I like why why you are yeah. And I thought I'm not going to be that. Why are you expecting that we are we're having thirty years? We're not having thirty years. Yeah, and see the, the, the it's it, Marrakesh in October is not that hot. <laughs> we know it's Marrakesh, it's always warm, it's not that hot. I mean, uh, uh, farmers in Morocco were running behind the corpse to to save either the green pepper or the uh, or the uh, whatever the um, the clementine. It's serious. Climate change is here. We are facing it now. The now the measures of it's not about only resilience and mitigation. So I, I just want to be more realistic. We don't, we cannot afford to be frustrated. We are here now because otherwise we are going to stay at our home waiting for the apocalypse. I mean, like I don't, I don't think that that anyone here because actually we are here. I mean, like people of Marrakesh are here too. People of Marrakesh actually three weeks ago, less than a month faced a, a horrible disaster, a horrible economical disaster. If you come out of, go out of this city, you will see uh, the damage. You will see the, the, the mourning families still mourning for, for their beloved one. Do, do you think that those people are waiting for your frustration? This city actually stood in its feet to, to, to have you here today. So at least show some dignity and do not be depressed. Because it's, I mean, I believe in people and we are here today because I believe, we believe in a movement, some kind of movement. I don't want to, to be, to sound very dreamy, but we are here because we are forming a sort of movement. So let's try to uh, push with this movement, at least to die with dignity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Shirin. 
I know that there are a lot of other points that were raised and maybe some were responded on, some of you reacted on some. And if you would like to add anything before concluding, okay. So uh, I guess that uh, the, the cocktail will be an opportunity to uh, further our discussion. And uh, don't forget, there are a lot of things to, 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 to share, but right, Right before uh, concluding, I would like to invite uh, Lina Simet from Human Rights Watch. Thank you. She will. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for short. the interesting uh, discussion. Just a very brief announcement, and I think it builds very nicely on Shireen, your uh, your concluding remarks. We, in the last couple of months, um, a series of organizations have joined in a collective call for the right to social security and making universal social security a reality uh, with specific demands on the IMF as well as the World Bank. And we drafted a joint statement that is now signed by more than 60 human rights and economic justice organizations. Many of them are in this room. And we, um, following the cocktail, we will have a meeting right here in this room uh, to discuss strategies um, and uh, upcoming opportunities during the, the annual meetings, but also uh, beyond. So it would be wonderful um, if, uh, if you could join that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. So you're all invited for the cocktail and then for the strategy discussion. I would like to thank you again, Isabel, Iman, Shirin, and uh, you, Farah, thank you for the, your support and the organization. She worked a lot in the back office to make this happen. Thank you, Farah. And thank you all. Please, you're all invited to, to the cocktail.